Okay, welcome everyone to the May AT Juice Lecture. Just a reminder again that this uh, meeting, this lecture is being recorded and you can find all previous lectures for the AT Juice Lecture Series on the Kite YouTube page that is found on the Kite website. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Uh, Tarun Arora present. Dr. Arora is a researcher interested in promoting movement and function in individuals with neurological impairments. He is trained as a, a physical therapist in India and pursued his graduate education in Canada. During his PhD at the University of Saskatchewan, he studied the biomechanics of postural control in individuals with spinal cord injury. Later, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and the Kremble Research Institute in Toronto, investigating non-invasive methods of neural stimulation for the assessment and treatment of neurological impairments. Currently, he works as a researcher at Oslo University Hospital in Norway, where he is developing electrophysiology biomarkers for posture and gait disorder in Parkinson's disease. The title of his talk today is Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Based Assessment in Spinal Cord Injury. I ask that if you ha have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. However, we are going to hold all the questions to the question period after the presentation. But feel free as questions arise to put them in the chat. I will collect them and uh, we will have the questions answered during the question period. So without further ado, Dr. Aurora, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian, uh, for the introduction. Let me share my screen with you all and let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see my presentation? Looks great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, just a second. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for having me today. And as Brian said, I'll be talking about use of transcranial magnetic stimulation for spinal cord injury assessment today. And before I proceed, I have a couple of slides from my um, background and research interest. I thought visuals speak louder than words, so I put together a couple of slides here. I'm originally from New Delhi, India, where I was trained as a physical therapist. And after that, I moved to Canada for my higher education and my uh, postdoctoral training as well. So I spent about 12 years in Canada and some part in the U.S. as well. And a lot of my research focused on different aspects of spinal cord injury. For example, during my master's at University of Regina, I worked with Dr. Kerry Staples looking at the effects of leisure time physical activity in people with spinal cord injury on their fitness levels. And then later on for my PhD, I worked on the biomechanics of posture and balance with Dr. Allison Oates and Dr. Kristen Musselman um, at University of Saskatchewan. And they're both here today. Uh, I got to see them, so that's great. Later on, I moved to a Cleveland Clinic to do a postdoctoral training in non-invasive brain stimulation for promoting upper extremity recovery in people with spinal cord injury. And then later, uh, later on, I moved to Toronto Western Hospital to work with Dr. Robert Chen to gain some advanced skills in uh, non-invasive neuromodulation. So currently, I am working at Oslo University Hospital in the Department of Clinical Neurophysiology with Kristen Barnard. And I must say, I've been very fortunate and I'm very grateful to have worked with all these fantastic people. So in terms of my research interest, as I was trained as a physical therapist, to the core of my heart is um, ability or um, to promote functional independence and recovery in people with neurological impairments. And I aim to achieve that through advancing assessment and treatment options for individuals with neurological impairments. And my research has utilized different methods, including clinical, biomechanical, and neurophysiological skills. But today I'll be talking about a non-invasive measure of uh, 
brain stimulation, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or also popularly known as TMS. So in my presentation today, I will be first briefly talking about the technique itself, what transcranial magnetic stimulation is, what it entails, what are different um, outcome measures that can be used um, uh, using transcranial magnetic stimulation. And then later on, I'll present a study where we used TMS to study corticomotor inhibition in people with spinal cord injury. So as I mentioned, TMS is a non-invasive way of brain stimulation. And if we talk about brain stimulation, it has been existing for over a century now. You can find papers from early 1900s talking about stimulation of the brain to find eloquent areas before uh, surgeons could remove certain parts of the brain in patients who had epilepsy or tumors. But you can imagine how quite an ordeal it can be to cut open the brain um, to, to find the, the, uh, the eloquent areas or to study the uh, corticospinal behavior. Also, uh, another, um, another uh, limitation of such invasive method can be it's only performed when it's clinically indicated. So as you can imagine in patients who, are, who have tumors or epileptic attacks, but it cannot be used purely for research uh, purposes because of the potential harm to the participants. So moving forward to 1980s, Barker and colleagues uh, developed this technology where one could non-invasively induce currents in the superficial layers of the brain or the cortical regions, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, in principle, it uses the, uh, uh, the principle of uh, electromagnetic induction where there is um, a coil attached to a capacitor uh, and uh, there is, whenever the uh, button is pressed, there's a huge amount of current that flows into, into the coil. And that produces a magnetic field up to two Tesla. And this rapidly changing magnetic field can induce current into the superficial cortical uh, layers of the brain, and which can be strong enough to induce a motor evoke potential um, in the muscles if the magnetic field is targeted um, at the appropriate cortical structures. So this motor evoke potential then can be used to study the, the um, corticospinal physiology in healthy controls and in patients as well. Now, the two key benefits of this technique is, first of all, obviously it's non-invasive, but also it has a very high temporal resolution. So it can be uh, combined with other stimulation techniques as well to study the neurophysiology. So. Um, I have a video uh, to show to you in case you are new to TMS so that you can understand the, the process um, or you can visualize the process to have a better understanding of it. And so before um, I play it, I'm just gonna um, tell what you can look at when looking at the video. So first of all, my colleague, David Cunningham is holding the TMS coil over the um, brain of, um, uh, one of the subjects. And um, you can see there are three spherical markers on the coil. And there's a camera on the top right of the screen. So that camera basically tracks the position of the coil over the participant's head. And in the, uh, in the screen in front of David, he can see which areas he's activating using the TMS. Also on the second screen, he can see the EMG activity, which is being recorded from um, a hand muscle in, in, in this participant. So I'm gonna play the video and you can see what the method entails. So that click is whenever David is pressing the button and he's targeting different regions on the brain. That's the muscle twitch being recorded using EMG. And that's the EMG activity and motor evoke potential. And it can be combined using two coils to study, for example, connectivity between different hemispheres. Uh, 
All right. So um, I hope that everyone has a basic idea. Basically, we are stimulating the cortical regions with the um, uh, magnetic coil, and uh, we are recording the motor evoke potential from the target muscle, which can then be characterized to study the uh, cortical motor neurophysiology. Now, how is this motor evoke potential generated? So basically, TMS activates the exons of horizontal cortical interneurons in the superficial layer of the brain. But at high intensities, it can also directly activate the exons of the pyramidal tracts, which can lead to motor evoke potential. And if in an individual, we record um, the, uh, from the spinal cord, then you can individually see the different I waves, I1, I2, I3, as shown here at lower intensities. And if we raise the intensity, then basically you can see a direct wave before the I1 here. So this is, these waves are basically generated at the cortical level. And then at the level of spinal cord, these can be summated to generate an action potential which leads to motor evoke potential being recorded in the EMG. So this has been done using neurophysiological studies before. Now the recent studies are mapping the um, electric electric field uh, of the TMS, and it confirms that the areas that are um, activated um, using TMS are mainly the superficial layers, uh, which leads to the I waves, but at higher intensities, there can be activation of the subcortical white matter directly, uh, which is basically the uh, activating the exons of the pyramidal tracts. Now, in terms of, um, what are the commonly TMS-based measures? So as I mentioned, motor evoke potential um, is itself an important uh, phenomena, and we can look at the latency of this motor evoke potential or even peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of motor evoke potential. And in, in someone with a spinal cord injury, for example, or some other um, impairments in the corticospinal tract, uh, the latency of this MEP will be delayed or the amplitude will be smaller or one would need higher intensity of the uh, stimulator output. Uh, so that's the intensity of the TMS. So one might need higher intensity to even generate MEP. So that's how uh, the different characteristics of MEP help us understand about the corticospinal physiology. Another equally important um, uh, mechanism uh, which governs the movement control is the inhibition inhibitory system. And TMS can be used to study corticospinal inhibition using a metric called silent period or also contralateral silent period. So basically, if someone is contracting their muscles and you stimulate their cortical region with TMS pulse, what you see is there is this brief silence in their EMG activity. And this brief silence in the activity is called the silent period. And again, you can study different characteristics of it. So for example, you can look at the onset, you can look at the duration of um, the CSP and also percentage decrease. So for example, someone who has a Parkinson's disease, they have reduced inhibition. So their silence, silent period duration will be reduced. So that's how TMS can be used to study the inhibitory uh, properties as well. Another measure is um, what we call a somatotopy. So basically, uh, somatotopy allows us to study the representation of different muscles um, um, at the level of cortex. So here we collect the motor evoke potential for multiple regions on the brain. And then based on certain criteria, for example, amplitude, we can decide whether that area is active or not. And by counting the number of all active sites, we can calculate the area. And if we incorporate the concept of uh, MEP amplitude at these areas as well, then we can calculate the total volume as well. And in people with spinal cord injury, um, uh, th there's, there's a possibility that the muscles proximal to the injury might have a greater representation indicating um, 
a greater number of neural resources available to the intact muscle, whereas muscles below the level of injury might have smaller area. Lastly, as I mentioned, TMS can be um, combined with, um, for example, another coil of TMS, so paired stimulation, or it can also be combined with other measures like deep brain stimulation and even peripheral stimulation. Um, cere cerebellar condition, conditioning stimulation, CBI, is one protocol that combines cerebellum with the motor cortex, or we can look at interhemispheric inhibition. But this becomes too complex, so um, we will not talk about that today, but I will present a study um, on corticospinal inhibition in people with spinal cord injury. So this work was done uh, when I, I was at Cleveland Clinic, and I want to acknowledge uh, my mentor, Dr. Ila Pla on the, on the right, and also uh, Dr. Uh, GLU, who joined as a postdoctoral fellow when I was leaving, and she was very instrumental in helping me in completion of the study. So um, you all may be aware of the numbers uh, which, are, which have been there since 2010. Uh, in Canada, over 86,000 people are living with spinal cord injury, and every year over 4,000 new injuries are reported. And more than 50% of people who have traumatic injuries, um, it leads to tetraplegia, so impairments in upper extremities, trunk, and lower extremities. And in these individuals, regaining upper extremity function is a top priority. But currently, the outcomes are variable and, and limited. So the recovery after injury is limited. And the whole idea is if we can better understand the neurophysiological mechanisms underlying these motor impairments, then hopefully we can develop more effective and targeted rehabilitation strategies. So that's where TMS um, comes into role. And um, the changes in the motor evoked potential, MEP itself, has been uh, studied quite well in people with spinal cord injury. And it has been reported that people with spinal cord injury have inconsistent MEPs, they have smaller amplitude and there's delayed latency. It has also been associated, or the changes in the MEPs have also been associated with motor impairments and functional recovery. For example, there has been a recent paper where they said the presence of MEP in an acute stage can predict uh, up to 20 22 to 45% of functional recovery in people with spinal cord injury. However, Corticomotor inhibition has, um, which is also important to understand functional recovery, has not been studied that well in, in people with spinal cord injury. And we know that TMS can be used to study corticomotor inhibition using uh, the measure of uh, contralateral silent period. So this is the same figure I showed you before. If someone is contracting their muscle and we deliver a TMS pulse, then we see uh, a brief silent period uh, following the evoked potential. And the, the mechanisms underlying these, um, this silent period is thought to be resulting from spinal and supraspinal contributions. So this is an older study where they investigated H reflex um, at different time intervals from TMS. So here at the bottom, you see um, motor evoked potential followed by a silent period. And on the top, you see two kind of um, signals. So the top one is unconditioned pulse. So um, without any conditioning uh, of the H reflex. And the, the bottom one is conditioned H reflex. Uh, where a TMS is delivered at certain interstimulus interval before the H reflex. And what we see is that at 30 and 40 milliseconds here, because of the conditioning effect, the H reflex is inhibited. So that indicates for the early part, at least, early part of the CSP, there are um, the spinal mechanisms because the H reflex is not fully recovered in, in, in that time. Whereas post 50 milliseconds, um, 
there's full recovery of H reflex. So H reflex cannot fully explain the later half of the CSP. In another study, um, uh, the, the, the researchers studied the brain waves instead of H reflex. So if you remember from my previous slides, there are D waves, I1, I2, I3, which can be collected from the spinal cord itself. So in this study, the researcher collected the summation of these individual waves, which is shown in the black bar at different uh, interstimulus intervals. And they found that at around 50 millisecond, the, uh, the brain waves were, were not inhibited, but at later times, 100, 150, 200 millisecond, the brain waves were inhibited. So it was concluded that the later half results from the contributions of the supraspinal regions. Now, overall, um, I know it, it, it's quite technical, but the overall takeaway message is that your cortical silent or contralateral silent period uh, consists of both the spinal component, which is the, um, the early part, and a later supraspinal uh, contribution as well. So it's able to capture both. And in people with uh, spinal cord injury, there have been inconsistent find findings for contralateral cell period. For example, some have reported delayed CSP onset, um, some have reported prolonged or shortened or even no changes in CSP duration. So it's quite inconsistent. And this has led to inconsistent interpretations as well. So for example, some researchers uh, have suggested that this might be resulting from increased inhibition or even reduced inhibition. And we don't know whether it's functionally irrelevant or not. And the potential gaps um, resulting in these discrepancies can be that different researchers have studied different muscles. Also, there are differences in the methodologies and the, um, the, the, the number of participants that they included in their um, study work were smaller, three to 12. So we thought of studying the CSP in two upper extremity muscles in people with tetraplegia, where one muscle was affected to a larger extent as compared to the other muscles. So we thought we'll compare how the different extent of motor weakness is affecting CSP. And also, uh, we studied its relationship with the upper, extra, upper limb motor function to see the functional relevance of these metrics. So this study is a part of a larger um, multi-site trial that we were conducting at uh, Cleveland Clinic along with the um, Veterans Affairs Medical Center and Kessler Foundation. And the trial was looking at the effect of TDCS on upper extremity recovery. But today I'll be talking mainly about the um, baseline assessment portion, including the TMS measures. So in terms of um, inclusion and exclusion criteria, we recruited people um, over 18 years of age who had traumatic cervical spinal cord injury and uh, these were chronic injuries, so over one year uh, of time since injury. And uh, we excluded people who had contraindications to brain stimulation or, um, um, or other factors that might have hindered their participation in the study. For example, excessive tone or spasticity or um, traumatic brain injury, um, or if they, were on, uh, if, if they were participating in any other upper extremity therapies that might have confounded the results. And another important factor was we were looking, as I mentioned, we were looking for um, two different muscles affected to different degrees. So we recruit people who had weaker triceps muscles. So their MRC grade uh, was one to three. Um, so a, a grade of three would mean that people are able to complete the elbow extension movement against gravity um, and, and, and full range of motion. Less than three would be they're more impaired. So um, for example, they cannot complete full anti-gravity uh, range of motion. Um, the, two would mean that they can complete the range of motion in gravity eliminated position. One would mean 
just a flicker contraction. And we did not include people who had zero crit. So we wanted uh, them to have some muscle function. Whereas the biceps was at least three to five. So full range of motion against gravity, but uh, without resistance, but submaximal resistance or with complete resistance. And also in addition, um, the, the crates and these muscles were separated by at least one MRC. So both muscles couldn't have a grade of three. And in terms of upper extremity assessment, we used the measure of capabilities of upper extremity test, which is also called QT. And uh, out of that, we included seven tasks that involved proximal arm movement um, involving biceps and triceps. So for example, reach forward, reach up, reach down, pulling, pushing weights, and so forth and so on. Mm. In addition, each individual item was scored on a scale of zero to four. And this scaling was based on either number of repetitions or the amount of weight and um, time taken to complete a movement. So it led to a total score of zero to 28. And in terms of the CSP, again, we tested both um, biceps and triceps, and we collected data from the weaker side as determined using the UEMS or upper extremity motor score. And to collect CSP, we asked participants to contract their muscle uh, at 20% of their maximum voluntary contraction. And while they were contracting their muscle, we delivered a TMS pulse to the contralateral motor cortex um, at 120% of active motor threshold. So active motor threshold is the amount of intensity, that's a minimum amount of intensity needed to elicit uh, a motor evoke potential. And we went supra threshold, so we went above that to elicit a silent period. We used 30 trials uh, for each muscle, and then we analyzed the data using customized MATLAB scripts, which was based on a previous study. And the variables that we looked at was onset, duration, and the percentage depth. So how much was the decline in EMG activity uh, during that certain period? We used two-way ANOVAs, and we were interested in looking at the main effects of the group. So spinal cord injury versus able-bodied controls and the effect of the muscles, so biceps and triceps, and the interaction between the two. And then we did post-hoc comparisons if the results were significant, and we used T-test or Wilcoxon depending on whether the data was uh, normally or non-normally distributed. And the again, we used Pearson and Spearman correlation to study the association between CSP metrics and upper extremity motor, fun motor function, um, depending on whether the data was normally distributed or not. In terms of uh, results and discussion, so we were able to recruit 27 people with spinal cord injury and 17 healthy control. And um, the main thing that I want to highlight here is that we were able to, as I mentioned, recruit people with differences in the strength of biceps and triceps. So you can see clear difference in the MRC grade between the muscles and in individuals with spinal cord injury. And not only in the muscle strength, when we looked at the MEP characteristics, uh, it was confirmed that the extent of neurophysiological impairment were greater in people with spinal cord injury and triceps as compared to biceps. So here, if you look at the AMT, which is the, again, threshold, higher intensity of TMS was required to elicit MEP. The MEP amplitude was smaller in triceps, and also it was delayed. In biceps, uh, the only difference was observed in the MEP onset, where MEP onset was slightly delayed in people with spinal cord injury. And when we compared um, biceps and triceps within people with spinal cord injury also, we could see significant differences between the two muscles. So that kind of supports that we were able to recruit right kind of population to study how the extent of motor impairment affects the CSP. 
So looking at the main results, um, the top left results are the group scores for CSP onset and CSP depth. And you can see that for the triceps, which is um, blue in color, we had significantly delayed CSP onset as, co as compared to healthy controls here, and also as compared to biceps in people with spinal cord injury. And this can be visualized in an exemplary uh, figure on the right. You can see in a healthy controlled participant, the onset was at 29 milliseconds, whereas in uh, someone with spinal cord injury, it was 48.5 uh, um, millisecond onset. Also, when we look at the, the depth of CSP, we found that there was reduction in depth in people with spinal cord injury as compared to healthy controls. And interestingly, there were some um, differences within the between the muscles within the groups. So for example, in, in controls, the triceps had a greater depth, but that difference disappeared when we looked at the spinal cord injury. So that indicates the extent of CSP depth was reduced in uh, people with spinal cord injury, which can again be seen here if you compare top to bottom dark gray shaded region. You can see it's not very, the CSP is not very deep in someone with spinal cord injury. So these results show that in triceps, there was down regulation of the inhibitory control. Whereas if you look at the biceps, the, the duration of the CSP was prolonged as compared to healthy controls. So if we look at this exemplary figure here, the onset is comparable, but if you look at how long the CSP is, it's prolonged in a person with spinal cord injury, which kind of indicates that there's upregulation of the inhibitory control in the stronger muscle, lesser impaired muscle, which is biceps. So clearly the CSP characteristics were different between the um, healthy control and those with spinal cord injury, but these differences depended were dependent on what kind of muscle we were studying. And when we looked at the correlation, we found a significant association um, between the or negative correlation between the CSP onset for biceps and um, the QT scores. So poor function was associated with a greater delay in the onset. So that means um, that if there was a greater delay in the CSP onset, that meant more impairment. Whereas um, if we looked at the other two metrics of CSP duration and depth, um, better arm function was associated with increased duration and, um, and increase in the depth. Uh, which was found in the triceps muscle in this case. So these were some significant findings between the um, upper extremity function and the CSP characteristics. So in conclusion, what we found was that, first of all, yes, um, TMS can be used to study the inhibitory differences between those with and without spinal cord injury. Specifically, biceps had greater duration uh, of CSP, uh, whereas in the uh, which was which suggested a regulation of the inhibitory activity. Whereas in triceps, there was a delay in the onset, which is down reg regulation of inhibition, and even um, lesser extent of depth. Again, that's down regulation of inhibitory activity. And also these changes were uh, associated with the arm function. So again, a greater delay in onset uh, was associated with poor arm function. Whereas if there was increase in duration of depth, increasing better inhibitory control, that was associated with better arm function. Now, based on these findings, um, Although we did not directly capture H reflex or we did not capture the brain waves, if we have to make some interpretation about the potential mechanisms, then it might be a possibility that delay in the CSP onset 
or reduced CSP depth, which was seen more in the triceps muscle, might be related to the spinal me mechanisms because the triceps are more impaired. And also these changes correlated with poor upper extremity function. Whereas increased CSP duration, which was observed uh, more in less impaired um, biceps muscle and also related better with the upper extremity function might have resulted from the supraspinal mechanisms. Um, and in future studies can um, uh, run simultaneous atriflex or collect um, measurements directly from the um, spinal cord to see whether these hypotheses are true or not. So these are some of the references that I used. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I uh, really enjoyed how succinct that presentation was, and, um, and the, those graphics were, were very nice. So um, I did have uh, one question that, that was in the chat from Baptiste, and I hope I pronounced your name right. Apologies if it's not correct. But um, the question was, is a magnetic field produced uh, by a continuous or an alternative current? And if necessary, what is its frequency? So frequency of the current? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, to be, to be honest, I don't know the exact answer of how it is generated. Uh, what I know is that the current is stored in the capacitor. And when the person who's holding the coil presses the button, there's a rapid flow of the current in, in, in the coil, which is basically circular. Um, and then when there's sudden rise in the current, it because it's rapidly changing current, it generates a magnetic field up to two Tesla. And when there is rapid change in the magnetic field, then it induces the current in the cortical structures. Depending on the machine that you're using, the current can be set to monophasic or biphasic. Um, that's what I know. I'm not sure the current which is passed from capacitor to the coil, whether what kind of or what are the properties of that current. Does that answer the question? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a follow-up question or um, whether you need to clarify. I'll give you time for that as well. Oh, okay. It says that uh, you answered the question. Great. Fantastic. And uh, anyone can feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or raise your hand. Um, I, I get, my question I, I have was um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned, if I understood uh, you correctly, that there were um, some discrepancies in terms of the um, the inconsistency in the, uh, I think, the silent periods in mm -hmm. Prior research, and you mentioned um, some some possible reasons why there was that inconsistency. And um, one of them struck me as as interesting. But uh, I wonder if you could explain more in terms of the uh, sample size being small and how that would result in discrepancy in in results. Mm -hmm. All right. So <clears throat> let me show my results. So for example, some studies had really small sample size, right? For example, one study um, even reported absence of silent period in people with spinal cord injury. And even if we look at our results, right, there are some participants who had like almost absence of silent period, but that might not be true reflection of the entire population. Um, so that's why we thought like a bigger sample size uh, might be needed to, to come to a more definite conclusion of, of um, what are the changes in silent period following spinal cord injury, because a, a smaller sample size might not be true reflection of what's going on. I, I see. So I guess um, if I understand you correctly. Sorry, can, can you my, see my screen? I, I guess. Oh, I, no, I no, you just I, I, okay. you, uh, unshared. So. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, now now you can see my plots, oh, right? Yes. That's, that's, yes. So, for example, here you can see some participants had almost absence of silent period, right? 
So if you know someone is studying, for example, just a few participants and they pick on these, then they might conclude that there's complete absence of silent period in these individuals, which might not be um, a, a true indication of it. I see, I see. So, so just because of the variability in um, the outcomes from person to person at small sample size could lead to a um, misinterpretation, I understand. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. And um, are there any other questions from people? Yes, Kristen. Yeah, um, Tron, great job. Uh, really great job at uh, explaining some complex um, concepts, I think, to everybody. Um, is it okay if I ask a question that's it's not directly related to your the content you've presented, but um, yes. there's quite a few grad students uh, attending today. And uh, I know one thing that they often wonder about um, is finding postdocs and moving on to, to independent positions. And you did a great job of sort of providing your background and your journey at the beginning um, of the talk. But I was wondering if you could you know, offer any tips to the students online with respect to what should they look at when they're trying to find a postdoc um, or anything that you wish you had known when you started looking for postdoctoral opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Kristen. I think um, you might be able to give better answer to that because I've learned quite a lot from you and, and Alison is here as well. And um, you're right, it can be quite a daunting task to look for um, um, higher research positions. So some of the things that come to my mind is um, preparing well in advance. So if you know, you know, what kind of opportunities you are uh, looking out for, then start preparing in advance and then networking plays an important role a lot of times. And I'm sharing this based on my experience as well as um, experiences of the other people as well. And um, uh, if you're going to a conference, like don't be shy, just reach out to people and you know connect yourself to them, explain um, your background and what you want to do in future and why you want to do that. I think that plays a very important role. And um, in my case, um, I think, um, it was uh, luck mattered a lot as well. I knew what I wanted to do, but failures are very common. So for example, at the end of my PhD, um, during my PhD, I was doing biomechanics, but by the end of it, during the defense, I knew that I wanted to study the neurophysiological mechanisms underlying this behavior. So when I was applying for postdocs, um, the opportunity at Cleveland Clinic was not the first one that came to me. And there were some other opportunities that I was thinking of joining related in a more um, closer related area of biomechanics, which was my PhD work. But then I continued applying for jobs and reaching out to people. And I was fortunate to find the right opportunity at the right time. And I, I was able to continue in, uh, in the direction where I wanted to do. So I guess like persevering, uh, being perseverant, preparing in advance, and then networking plays a lot of uh, roles. So if you know people, you know, reach out to them. Even if you don't know, it doesn't harm to, you know, write emails. The success might be, the rate of success might be lesser in writing cold emails, but who knows? I got my opportunity like that. So there's no harm in that. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, a great question, Kristen. Maybe it's something that uh, needs to be put as a standing question to all the presenters in the future, because we do have a lot of trainees and sometimes that's the, the more important question to them. Okay, excellent. Are there any other questions that people may have? Hi, it's Derek. Sorry for not raising my hand. I'm just on my phone interface and wasn't sure how to do it. No worries. Go ahead, just Dave. Diving Go ahead, Derek. in. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, thank you for, for a very clear and and concise presentation, um, especially simplifying some challenging concepts. I was curious about your experience uh, using TMS with spinal cord injury, and if you had any participants that had to be excluded because uh, they couldn't, uh, because the power of the um, 
coil at the coil had to be turned up too high to elicit a motor evoked uh, potential and um, and how you suggest those of us who are interested in maybe pursuing research using TMS and spinal cord injury um, can can mm -hmm. um, can uh, mitigate those kind of factors thanks yeah that's a great question because that can happen in certain individuals with really low uh, corticospinal excitability, you might um, reach, um, you might max out in terms of the TMS intensity needed to elicit any motor evoke potential. So um, we have experienced that as well, and we had to exclude those participants from our research. Uh, a couple of ways to work around is uh, we can incorporate in our inclusion criteria that we will uh, include only participants who uh, have certain um, motor evoke potential responses uh, in response to TMS, and that will save a lot of time for them and for researchers as well. Um, so, you know, discussing that up front. Secondly, there are different coils, uh, different shape of coils and that come with uh, the, the TMS machines. So depending on the muscle that you are interested in, so for example, for lower extremity muscles, uh, there's a specialized double cone coil, which might be able to elicit motor evoke potential at lower intensities as compared to a figure of eight coil. So having um, having access to different coils might uh, help in getting the evoke potential at lower intensities as well. But again, even in using you know those kind of tools, there there might be cases that you might not be able to elicit motor evoked potential in some participants. Thank you. That's helpful. I Thank see you your very... question in the chat box. Yes. Did you want to read it? I can read it out too, um, just for the recording as well. So um, Sharon says, thanks for your great presentation. Did you have complete SCI TMS response in your studies? And did the bicep tricep response uh, related to level of injury? I hope I <laughs> asked that the right way. That's the question. Yes, um, that, that's a great question. So um, a complete injury would be Asia A, um, no motor or sensory function, right? And in our study, we were, we were recruiting participants who had at least some form of muscle contraction. So MRC grade one, irrespective whether they had Asia A, B, C, D, because even in Asia A, you can have zones of partial preservation where there can be some muscle function. So um, yes, we, we included participants with Asia A as well, if they had some muscle function. And uh, the biceps triceps response related, related to level of injury. So since we had um, people with cervical spinal cord injury as well, the, the amount of variability in the level of injury is very less. So it makes it harder for us to look at the correlation with the injury as such. But that's why we used uh, an upper extremity um, motor function to have more gradient in, in, in their function. And then that was associated with the CSP characteristics as well. But another point to add is that TMS can play a fantastic role even at looking at the, um, what you call the, I'm, I'm not able to think of the exact word, but the residual function, because um, the, the classification is based on um, the current classification of completeness or incompleteness is based on the Asia classification, which is, again, somewhat subjective. And uh, there are papers who have reported motor evoked potentials in people with Asia A. And there are more ways to elicit this residual connectivity by combining TMS with, um, for example, contraction of, of the other muscles like abdominal muscles or combining that with age reflex and other, other forms of stimulation. So that's a, an area of research in itself where uh, whether or not TMS can help identify people who have been diagnosed with AGIA but might have residual function and how or if there would be benefit of you know, channeling 
them through a different form of rehabilitation. So that's a good question in itself. Yes, great question. Um, and then there's uh, one more question. I think this will be the last question, just looking at time. But um, Thomas has a question as a follow up to uh, Derek's earlier question. Uh, how is the stimulus tolerated by individuals with SCI? My experience having um, with ha conducting TMS, I could only take it for a certain amount of time um, before having headaches and feeling extremely tired. All right. It's a very subjective thing how you feel uh, the TMS, um, how much intensity of TMS you can take. We have used uh, stimulation intensities of up to 100% as well, and they were well taken by uh, our participants. Uh, but I also know some labs which wouldn't go like 80% MSO as well. But um, we were able to complete testing on our participants with 100% MSO, and I know other labs doing the same, and it was well tolerated um, by our participants. Okay, Thomas, I hope that answers your question, and uh, thank you once again, Tarun, for an uh, amazing presentation and uh, for answering all those questions. So this is the last JUICE lecture until the fall, and we'll be starting again in September. So I thank you all for those who attended throughout this, this academic year. Uh, quick thank you for all the people who made this uh, lecture series possible as well. Thank uh, Lisa Fong for organizing the promotional materials and Erica Dorenzo and Heather Flett for sending out the uh, emails to notify everyone of the lecture series. Uh, Michael Grace DaCosta and uh, Jared Churchill for posting, helping me post the videos on the YouTube channel and also all uh, Tarun and all the other speakers that we've had this academic year. So uh, thank you again. And as always welcome any suggestions for future topics and speakers. And if this is your first time, welcome. And uh, we have monthly presentations. So feel free to email me uh, if you have any questions or to add yourself to the email list. So again, thank you Tarun once again. Thank you, Brian. Thank you and very much for having me. And thanks to you and the entire team for organizing this. Yes. And we look forward to see, hearing more of your future work coming up. Okay. Thank so thank you once again. And uh, we will see most, if not all of you, in the fall. Thank you.